All right. Good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar hosted by SCP Software. I'm Richard Yeager, Marketing Manager for SCP, and today I'm joined by Lanai Bain and James Del Monaco of SCP, as well as John Hoffer with Red Hat Storage. Lanai is the VP of Business Development for SCP and is responsible for North American business, business Development and Channel Partnerships. James Hamonico is our Senior Technical Support Manager and has been with, with SCP for several years. He knows his way around the software and can answer any in-depth technical questions you may have. And lastly, we have our Red Hat Storage guest speaker, John Hoffer. John has been around for more than 15 years and um, has had experience in storage administration and architecture experience and architecture experience, and we're happy to have him join us today and talk more about SCP's role in Red Hat storage environments. Today we're going to give a brief overview as to what we do and then dive into a live demo of our software in the Red Hat environment. Uh, feel free to ask any questions along the way. There will be a couple of Q&A sessions throughout the webinar, so please don't hesitate. And without further ado, let's kick it off to the nine and get started. Hey, thanks, Richard. Appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I uh, appreciate your time. Um, just wanted to kind of start out and, and give a brief overview of SEP, kind of who we are as a company, uh, what we do, what we focus on, and um, then, like Richard said, uh, we'll, we'll break for a quick Q&A. Uh, so if you guys all look at your GoToMeeting console in the upper right-hand corner, uh, there, is, there should be a little box there that says Questions. Uh, feel free throughout the presentation to type in any questions that you have, and, and like Richard had said, we'll, we'll have a quick break and we'll answer any questions. So SEP has been around for over 30 years as a production automation company and 20 years as a uh, backup and disaster recovery software company. So we originated in Germany um, in, in the 90s. and basically the way our, our software came about, we were hired uh, by some of our current customers at the, at the time, um, Alcatel and Ikea, to write some custom code uh, to back up some mission critical data in some of their warehouses. And over time, we realized that it was a, you know very successful. Uh, it worked really well. It was very quick and efficient. So we decided to completely rewrite that code from the ground up and bring that to market. So that's actually been rewritten from the ground up uh, several times since then. Um, we have a, a pretty decent sized presence in in EMEA market and we are uh, entered the US market about five years ago and we're growing very quickly here as well. So kind of overall points that we focus on as a company, um, there, there's three main points. And so the first one is to have one solution for an enterprise. And what we mean by that is we talk to a lot of folks, or we have talked to a lot of folks over the years, and we've really seen that people have a lot of different solutions in place to meet their needs if they have a large or heterogeneous or large and or heterogeneous environment. And so what we really focus on is working with organizations that have, you know, kind of broad needs as far as different platforms, different databases, uh, different virtual technology, and we're able to work with those organizations and really consolidate their backups and disaster recovery uh, solutions down into one easily managed central console. And so the way we're able to do that is just by supporting a very wide range of products. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit um, further in the presentation. So the second main thing that we focus on is performance. The goal from the beginning for us was to figure out how to get data from point A to point B in the fastest and safest and most efficient way possible. And <clears throat> I, I think that we've you know done a very good job of achieving that. Um, we use multi-streaming technology, and that's able to uh, back up up to 64 streams of data to a single tape drive or an unlimited stream of data uh, to, a, to a disk target. And so obviously that's going to reduce uh, backup times and, and really give us the, pretty much the fastest performance on the market today. From a reliability standpoint, that was pretty much a cornerstone of our uh, organization from the beginning. 
uh, being a German-based company meant that we had to um, meet some different requirements that would be necessary in, in the US um, because the laws are a little bit different in Germany. So as a backup company in Germany, if, if we tell another organization that we're going to be responsible for backing up their data, that means that we actually become financially responsible for all of their data. Um, so we definitely don't take that lightly. Um, and, and we've done a great job of having a product that's quick and efficient, but that is also reliable. So anytime you get a notification that a backup job was done successfully, you know that you can really go in and, and look at that task or you know a group of tasks or you know whatever the case may be and be confident that all of your data is there 100% of the time. Um, I remember when I first got into this industry, I was kind of surprised to hear people saying, you know, I did a backup, it said it was successful, and I opened a file and there was nothing there. And obviously, they were using another, you know, other products. Um, and to me, that just seemed amazing. I, I couldn't believe that that actually happened. Um, so, again, one solution for the whole enterprise: um, very quick and efficient method of getting data from point A to point B, or to multiple locations, or to off-site locations, um, and also uh, very reliable. And kind of as a fourth added bonus, um, you know, it's not something that we really focus on or. or you know, brag about, but it is something that's pretty important. I think um, our cost and the you know ROI and and TCO is um, very competitive. We normally come in at about forty percent of industry average. Um, so generally, that makes it very easy for organizations to uh, you know have a very strong financial case as well uh, to to switch over to our solution. Getting a little bit more into the overall concept of, of one solution for an enterprise, um, we have here just a couple um, icons of you know some of the different uh, operating systems, uh, applications, databases, et cetera, that we support. Um, we do support quite a wide range of things, so this is just kind of the most popular that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but the list is is pretty extensive above and beyond this. So starting on the left-hand side, um, you can see that you can run our main console on Linux, Windows, or Unix. Um, so obviously benefit to Red Hat users is that we don't force you guys to go out and get an additional Windows license and, and put that on if you have strictly a Linux environment. Um, while at the same time, if you guys already have a backup server that is running Windows and you did want to put it on there, you have the flexibility of doing that. Um, you could also choose to put it on Solaris if you wanted. Uh, you know, we, we pretty much just recommend uh, administrators install our software on whatever platform that they're most comfortable with. So we try and be as flexible as possible, not only from the main backup administrator console, but also from a, a client, um, client or agent uh, level as well. So support quite a wide range of, of operating systems there also, um, AIX, Mac, um, and, and many more. As far as um, applications go, e everything we do is at an API level. Uh, so we, we always try and have native communication with any type of uh, program or database or uh, virtual technology that we're going to be working with. So um, you know, in the case of um, Microsoft Exchange, we have um, you know, it's VSS aware, it's also DAG aware. Um, we have single file, single email, and single user restore capability. Um, everything's backed up real time online. Uh, same for GroupWise, same for uh, Lotus Domino or Lotus Notes, and databases as well. Uh, Oracle, we communicate directly with our man, um, and et cetera. Um, all the Microsoft products are VSS aware, SharePoint, uh, MSSQL. Etc. And then on the hypervisor side for the virtual technology, again, we communicate directly with the APIs. So uh, for VMware, Hyper-V, and for Citrix, uh, all you really need to do is authenticate to uh, VMware's vSphere or uh, you know, Citrix Zen Center. You don't have to actually install any software on those virtual platforms themselves at all. All you do is authenticate, and it will auto-populate a list of um, you know, guests and um, all the guests that are uh, listed under each host. So, and we'll get into that a little more as well. Uh, 
Okay. Um, getting in a little more on the multi-streaming technology. Um, basically, there there are other uh, backup companies out there that say they do multi-streaming, and there are several that do. Um, the difference, I think, is the level of performance that we see running our software in comparison to some of those other uh, solutions. And so basically, we can break it down very granular. So we can have one uh, stream of data coming from a single server, or it could be multiple streams coming from um, a single server, just depending on how the tasks are broken down. Uh, so really, that gives us very fast performance. Uh, we have one customer who, in a single backup task, kicks off 1,100 servers at the same time. So they have 1,100 streams running simultaneous to a, to you know a, a single group of targets. Um, so you know again, very high performance. It's scalable um, to a to a pretty high level, and we're seeing great performance rates. A couple examples of what we've been talking about so far. Um, Vodafone is um, a uh, partner company with uh, Verizon, and they are, I believe they're the uh, largest uh, cell phone company in, in Europe. Um, they currently have us, uh, they're currently using SEP for 1,500 uh, remote sites, and I believe they're rolling SEP out to another 4,200 uh, remote locations over this uh, next year, year and a half. So again, um, you know, just kind of goes to show the scalability and the fact that you can manage quite a few remote locations from a central console. Um, also, the Guardia Seville, they're kind of equivalent to the FBI and the State Patrol kind of put together um, and, and in Spain. And so we have, uh, they use SCP for their uh, entire enterprise at over 450 sites across Spain. Um, closer to home, you know, US National Archiving and Records Administration uh, uses SCP for their enterprise email system. And with our multi-streaming technology, we were able to take their backups from over six and a half days and, and bring that backup window down to 11 hours. I think the first, the very first task that we set up and, and ran that was a full backup of everything, I think was about 13 hours. And then after we did a little modifying and, and some adjustments, we got down to about 11 hours. Um, so again, you know, pretty substantial reduction in backup windows because of the multi-streaming, because of um, you know the built-in integration with SAP, that it's able to go out and based on previous backups, it's able to tell which data is going to be the you know um, what order it is going to be the quickest to backup which servers in what order. Um, another quick example: Port of San Diego. Uh, their backups went from over four and a half, uh, or sorry, over 100 hours down to uh, about four hours. Um, so again, quite a reduction in time, and um, you know, a little more specifically, they had a bunch of Oracle servers. I think they had about 13, 14, 15 Oracle servers uh, that were were previously taking almost five hours. I think it was about four hours and 45 minutes, and, and those backups went down to 42 minutes. So um, very effective on databases as well. A couple other uh, features that we'll touch on real quick. Uh, we do have. Um, archiving capabilities that uses WORM technology and um, basically just a, a file archiving technology that's built directly into our console. Uh, very easy to manage, very simple to set up, can be set up in, in four or five clicks. Uh, we also have uh, deduplication uh, built in and replication as well. And uh, one thing that I also like to touch on is the fact that we use all generic drivers. and. What we mean by that is we don't have our own custom drivers that we write internally. We use uh, operating just general operating system drivers. So what that means is any type of media or storage that's recognized by an operating system, we're able to back up to. So that gives our customers you know, pretty much free reign on selecting any type of media that they want, whether it be you know, something that's older that they haven't used for a while that they want to pull out of the closet and put back in production, you know, up to the latest and greatest LTO device or a new SAN unit or, um, you know, anything. It, it really leaves 
uh, all the options open so people don't have to wait for us to come up with our own custom drivers, you know, make sure there's no bugs in them, go through that process, certifications, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so again, just we, our whole goal is to be able to fit into any enterprise and, and offer as much um, flexibility as possible. We also offer bare metal recovery. Uh, we have bare metal recoveries for uh, Linux, Windows, and also for Windows, Windows workstations. And basically it just uh, captures the entire um, operating system, partitions, um, you know, everything, and creates a bootable image file. And that bootable image file um, can be brought up on similar or dissimilar hardware on physical or on a virtual machine. Um, so it, it offers quite a bit of flexibility as, as well. Back to our virtual technology. Um, kind of already went over a brief introduction of that. A um, couple things I will mention, a couple cool features that we do have. Um, if anyone is using Citrix Zen Server, uh, one of the cool features we have for that is we've solved the problem of activation loss. So if any of you guys have ever blown away a VM or had a VM go down um, and, and it was running Windows and you tried to restore it, you've probably had to enter in the product uh, key code, the Windows uh, authentication code. And so what we've done is kept the same UID and the same MAC address so that anytime you bring back a machine, whether it's in the same you know, Zen pool or a different pool, um, it, it really doesn't make a difference. It just comes right back up, it keeps all of the authentications, and you're just ready to go. So there's no downtime, you don't have to go hunt for licenses or anything like that. Um, with VMware, uh, one of our, our cool new features is if you back up virtual machines to a um, like an NFS, NFS share, for example, um, you actually don't have to wait to restore the VM like you normally would if you just have an image level backup. Um, you can actually separate out the VMDK file and spin up that VM directly off of the copy of the backed up data. So you pretty much essentially have zero downtime. Uh, you don't have to, you know, wait for an entire image to be restored back before you can spin it up and get it running again. Um, again, we talked about Hyper-V, uh, fully VSSware, uh, and very similar functionalities to Zen Server and uh, uh, VMware. We also have a solution for open source Zen um, as well. If, if anyone's interested in that, um, let us know and we can give you some more information on that as well. Okay, so that is a quick overview. Uh, again, just wanted to kind of give you guys a, a brief overview. If there's any questions, um, if you guys can please submit those and we will uh, go ahead and, and start answering some of those. Um, give me one second here just so I can expand the questions box and, and see what you guys are uh, putting in. So we do have a question um, and it's asking about um, KVM support, so asking if we support KVM. Um, and, and the answer is uh, currently the KVM is the KVM API is under development, so we, we don't really have the opportunity to, to support that yet. Um, as soon as the API is finished and complete, then we will uh, fully we will fully support KVM as well. Uh, so that's the answer. Um, yeah, we're, we're basically just just waiting for that API to be done so that we will support that as well. All right, any other questions coming in? Okay, I've got another question. It asks, um, are you guys able to, you mentioned, hold on, sorry. Are you guys able to back up to tape as well as disk? You mentioned both. And the answer is yes. Uh, we can back up to directly to tape. We can back up to disk first. Um, we can back up to disk and then have copies of that data replicated out to tape or to remote locations. Um, there, there's quite a bit of flexibility. And one of the really cool things that is newer for us is the ability to back up to Red Hat Storage as well, which uh, John's going to be talking about shortly. And so we can actually set up Red Hat Storage as a target for SEP and back up to uh, Red Hat Storage, which can then replicate that out to the cloud or different geographical locations or you know really really anything so that's that's one of our 
really cool new features as well. Okay, any other questions? All right, looks like we are going to switch over to John now. Uh, John, I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter and uh, go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, just a moment. Uh, let me get my presentation going here. One moment, please. And in the meantime, if anyone else has any questions, uh, please feel free to put those into the questions box uh, for John as well. And we'll have a little Q&A session uh, right after his portion. And you guys can ask some questions about Red Hat storage, hopefully. Yeah, happy, happy to answer everyone's questions. Uh, the, just got a few slides here as an introduction to Red Hat storage and our integration points and opportunities with uh, SEP. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, Lanai, can you confirm that you're seeing my uh, first slide? Yep, looks good. Great, okay. So we'll just jump right in here. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, as, as the case may be. As Lanai said, my name's uh, John Hoffer, um, so Solution Architect with Red Hat Specific for our storage offering, uh, which uh, it would not be at all surprising if you were to say that you had no idea that Red Hat had a storage offering, and that's okay. Uh, it's relatively new. About a year and a half ago, Red Hat acquired uh, Gluster uh, and has turned that into a fully supportable, complete stack for software-defined storage. So Red Hat's not getting into the hardware business. We're still about software, but by doing storage as a software function, we're able to get we're able to gain a lot of flexibility and a lot of new opportunities for how we scale, deploy, and manage storage, especially in the new IT model uh, of virtualized and even cloud-based services. Uh, certainly, you could deploy Red Hat storage on the exact same hardware you would normally expect to deploy uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, your, your typical x86 type of servers. Uh, but the great thing is that because we're software-defined storage, those servers then become a multi-petabyte scalable NAS type of namespace. So you're not limited to just the storage that you might have attached to or within a single server. Red Hat Storage combines multiple servers into a scalable namespace. And those could be physical hardware. It could be virtual hardware as well, whether it's Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, VMware, or other hypervisors. Uh, Red Hat storage can be deployed as a virtual machine and thereby freeing up an exposing capacity that might otherwise be trapped if you open it up to a scalable NAS type of, of namespace. And certainly, because it's, like I said, Red Hat Linux, uh, it could be deployed in the cloud as well. And this is a real differentiator if you compare versus your typical enterprise storage solutions or typical enterprise NAS solutions. Uh, Software-defined storage can be deployed anywhere you need it to be, including the public cloud. Uh, Amazon is just one example of that. Uh, the, the scalable namespace would be accessed and consumed by your applications or other uh, or users. Uh, one application example is SCP system, of course. Uh, accessed exactly the same whether it's deployed on-premise, virtually, or in the cloud, and the example that I gave earlier was perhaps you're doing uh, local backups to Red Hat storage, and you'd like to replicate that off-site, but maybe you don't even have your own physical site. You'd like to replicate that to the cloud uh, for data protection, business continuity, recovery purposes. We can do that with Red Hat storage and not have any changes, not have to make any kind of changes to the application infrastructure to accomplish that. So Red Hat Storage it is designed for a variety of types of data. Uh, we're definitely going after where the growth is. Everyone is experiencing huge amounts of data storage capacity growth, but it's mostly around unstructured data. 
the, the problem of the good old relational database that's kind of been solved in terms of how would you architect for performance and scalability and availability for a database, but it's the unstructured data that we see as causing our customers new and, and very interesting challenges now. It could be anything from just files and folders and content, uh, just the generic stuff of the enterprise, uh, all the way up to big data, um, MapReduce kinds of calculations, machine-generated data, the, the huge volumes of data that are coming out of our IT environment. Uh, we'd like to be able to get some intelligence and some value out of those. Storing that amount of information on a traditional enterprise storage system can be cost prohibitive. A new model is needed. And the kind of scale-out commodity software-defined storage that is Red Hat storage enables that. There's also a lot of growth around uh, what you could call object data or long-tail data or archive data. In some cases, in fact, in many cases, this is the backup, uh, the longer-term retention backups or just the cyclical backups uh, that you're doing from perhaps SCP or other solutions. Uh, you're keeping them around a lot longer. The, the idea of, of overriding backups when it's on disk often is, is starting to go, uh, go out of favor a little bit. We need to keep more backups for audit purposes, compliance purposes, just being able to show the, the history of the organization. You've got to keep it, but then the access pattern starts to trail off, tail off after a while so that you get this idea of long tail or archive data. All of these count as unstructured data, and all of these are great use cases for Red Hat storage for a scale-out uh, software-defined storage platform. And when we're putting these things together, what I want you to kind of think about, uh, if you will, please, is, is as when I talked about their their ability to deploy flexibly, flexibly, lots of parallel streams for high performance, many supported platforms. Uh, consider how the scale out storage capabilities on the Red Hat side are going to complement that and eliminate the bottlenecks, eliminate the limitations, eliminate. The, the ceilings, as it were, of using perhaps traditional storage technologies. The way we build that all up starts with the basic concept of a server or a node. Could be physical, could be virtual, could be a cloud instance, but it's just another operating system, <coughs> excuse me, another operating system instance where we're going to install Red Hat storage. Big surprise, Red Hat storage runs on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, so certainly any place you can deploy Linux physical, virtual, or cloud, we can deploy Red Hat storage. Some amount of capacity would be presented to that node as usually a file system or some kind of disk device, for example. We'll call that a brick uh, just because you build things with bricks. And we're going to build this abstracted or virtualized volume across those bricks. You can have two or four or 40 bricks in your volume, and it still looks like a single namespace to the storage consumers, backup applications, business applications, whatever the storage consumer might be, that volume still looks like a single instance, regardless of how many physical or virtual bricks we use to put it together. That's the power of the Gluster technology that's built into Red Hat storage, Gluster being the scale-out file distribution mechanism inside that part of that Red Hat storage stack. So you start with your servers. Servers have capacities that are bricks. We build those up into volumes, and those volumes can be a target for a variety of things, such as just to this backups. Just to give you an example of, of some of the parallelism and the scale-out technologies uh, that Red Hat storage has that you're able to exploit with a highly parallelized uh, distributed application architecture, the simplest way we build one of those volumes is a distributed volume. And we're going to take the files, the content, and just as evenly as possible distribute those across the servers of the bricks that are in the volume. It still looks like a single namespace to the client or the storage consumer, but underneath the files are distributed across multiple bricks. Again, physical, virtual, or cloud. To the consumer, to the client, it all looks exactly the same. Another way to build a volume is a replica volume, the idea being we want to add some high availability to that volume namespace, and it kind of looks like what you see there. You're going to mirror or replicate the files from one brick to another. This is still local, kind of
kind of uh, think a local LAN type of cluster uh, for this particular namespace and volume, but we add high availability and some load balancing and performance to the volume by mirroring that data between two different bricks. File 1 and File 2 exist on both bricks, and to scale that out, we just combine those two volume types, um, distributing across replicated volumes so you get the high availability, think of it like a, a mirror, right? And then you get the distribution <coughs> to scale horizontally. Hundreds of terabytes, petabytes are not a big deal with Red Hat storage. If you're backing up your entire enterprise, as I said, a single solution for backup, the volume is going to grow, and much of that will be best served to be on disk for the near-term backups. This is the way you architect the disk solution, the disk storage behind that, to make it highly available, highly scalable, and still very parallel and, and, and high throughput without running into any bottlenecks. Remember, we're doing this as a scale out, so each of the servers that we add, one, two, three, four, here for example, we can go up to 40, 50, 60 servers, no problem in a Red Hat storage environment. Each of those servers is adding network connectivity, CPU, memory, disk I.O., all of the capabilities each of those servers has is, is contributing to that overall namespace, providing that high throughput back end for the SCP parallel multi-stream backup process. Let's see, is this, oh, it is a build slide, sorry. So putting those two together, the, the broad cross-platform support of SAP SESM with the scale-out capabilities and flexible deployment models of Red Hat storage, uh, you've got the obvious use case of just enabling disk-to-disk -disk backup without spending huge amounts of capital and time and effort and complexity in architecting either with an enterprise, traditional enterprise SAN or traditional enterprise filer. We're doing this with commodity hardware or virtual infrastructure and putting that namespace together for the disk-to-disk -disk backup. But as, uh, as I said, we can also include data replication as another feature built into Red Hat storage. One of the biggest and most cumbersome problems of any data protection strategy is the offsite factor. Great, I backed up my data. There's a lot of it. I need to get it somewhere else. In the past, we would take those tapes and make copies of them and put them on a truck, and the truck would go down the highway, and we had hoped that everything turned out okay on the other end. More and more, our customers are wanting to use the, their own network technologies and WAN and other sites and make that off-site backup at least be accessible if not 100% active and live. So the geo-replication capabilities in Red Hat storage allow you to get that backup out of the building and to another location transparently, seamlessly, and it's almost fire and forget. Once it's set up, it's going to run in the background and there's no need to worry about Excuse me. There's no need to worry about how am I going to accomplish the off-site component of my data protection strategy. It's all built into the two complementary technologies. So just to recap really quick on, on Red Hat storage, yes, it's software only. You might have heard the phrase software-defined storage from other vendors. This is really the next generation of open standards-based storage where we'll use your choice of hardware, but it's the software that builds up the capabilities that add value to the business. It is a, mo a modern architecture without any legacy ties to any kind of legacy storage architectures. It's completely new and completely modern, and ab absolutely, as I said, you've got your choice of deployment, physical hardware, virtual, cloud. It's very flexible. As you saw, we can add and remove capacity very elastically. Uh, if you need more capacity, just add more nodes. Uh, the namespace is always available and dynamically grows automatically. And the whole purpose is to really to change the economics of the information access that, uh, that we need to provide to our businesses. So that is what I have for slides. I want to open it up for questions and hand things back over to my friends from SCP to bring it all together. Okay. Thank you very much, John. That was that was great. Um, 
If anyone has any questions, uh, please again go ahead and type those into the questions box, and uh, I'll read those out, and we can we can answer those questions. Um, and, and just to kind of recap, um, you know, and and kind of throw in our two cents, I think that one of the reasons we're really excited about working with Red Hat Storage is because of their flexibility. Just the fact that they can go in and work with any different type of hardware for us is great because we have the exact same concept. We want to open up as much opportunity for people to design their infrastructure in the best way for them you know, and not have a bunch of different requirements that we need on our side or try and dictate, you know, what direction people go in in the future. We try and leave that as open as possible. So I think, you know, the whole Red Hat storage product is is excellent for that. And, and the two, you know, working together, I think, really add value to any organization. Um, okay, looks like... John, it looks like you did an excellent job. I don't see any questions coming in. So you must have answered, you preemptively answered everyone's questions. All right, I am going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to uh, James Delmonico. And uh, James is one of our uh, lead engineers. And he's going to go through and uh, just kind of give an overview of SEP, um, what, the, what the GUI looks like. Um, and, and you know some of the the functionality and so we can uh, go ahead and get started on that and James looks like I can see your screen just fine so I will go ahead and turn it over to you okay um, this is a fresh installation of Ceph Sesame on uh, Windows 2008 um, everything that Sesame supports uh, is the exact same feature set on um, Red Hat Linux, uh, and as well as Solaris. So everything you see here, even though this is a Windows machine, applies uh, equivalently to uh, Linux systems. Um, additionally, uh, the storage requirements are such that um, we can use any operating system. So you can combine um, whatever operating systems you have to, um, to use the storage. Um, in the special case with Red Hat storage, um, we can have many nodes all writing to the same cluster volume. And for uh, high-performance systems, that is great because anywhere that Red Hat storage is in use, um, any of those machines can write directly um, to that even at the same time. Um, we call that a, a data store, and that's just a pass target um, for our system. And that mainly um, keeps the device from getting full, so it helps to manage uh, expired data as well. Um, for the, the client interface, we detect any type of running services. Um, we use the GUI to actually choose those. So if we had uh, SQL or anything like that, we would show that is available. Um, with Red Hat, commonly we see um, you know, Open LDAP, Oracle, and um, all of that uh, technology supported as well. Um, to help us leverage the multi-streaming, um, we use a group-based uh, structure so we can schedule against the policy. Um, I've gone ahead and put in a couple um, groups just to show what, um, what we commonly use. Um, with the hypervisor support, um, that's agentless support. And so we connect any uh, member of the pool, and then we're able to see all the different virtual machines. And it, it doesn't matter if high availability is moving those around to different actual physical nodes. Um, and so we just select uh, an individual item to add the task. And once we've added the task, um, we put them in an appropriate group um, to emulate what a schedule would do, a backup schedule. Um, we do a full backup. In, in this case, we're doing it to our RHS uh, uh, drive group. And so the will start all of the different streams at the same time. Um, so now that I've started this group, we have a few different tasks all running at the same time. And Sesame is storage agnostic, so we can use um, any any form of storage. Um, and uh, you know, disk to disk to tape is all supported in any combination thereof. Um, here we can see some of our jobs are starting to go through here. Um, as far as the supported operating systems, um, there's a list here. We support all the Windows-based uh, operating systems, um, <clears throat> as well as uh, VMS, NetWare, and all the Unix-based operating systems. Um, there's also 
support for all the hypervisors that are commonly in use, you know, ESX, um, Citrix, Open Source Zen. Um, we do support Mac OS um, as well as some of the actual uh, SAM technologies for doing uh, SAM level snapshots like NetApp. Um, as far as um, structure and reporting, um, stuff is very easy to use. And so normally we do the schedule one time against the groups, and then after that, when we add jobs, we just add the jobs, put them in the appropriate group, and we don't really have to worry about scheduling or, or maintaining a lot of complexity. So um, it's kind of a set it and forget it approach. Um, with storage targets, that's what supports, of course, tape and disk. Um, but with, with disk and Red Hat storage, we, um, we use these drives, and we're able to use groups um, to group those drives. And that would be the same concept as um, having two drives in a tape loader, um, where we could just say, OK, use that group as a target. The system will figure out the best tape drive to use um, and aggregate the jobs on its own. Um, same thing applies with Red Hat storage. We can have many different drives and different nodes here all attached, and, um, and, and those can write at the same time. So um, Sesame does open files, has uh, you know, Active Directory support included by default, uh, as well as uh, some of the other directory systems. And so you should be able to back up everything in your environment with uh, Red Hat Server, uh, Red Hat Storage, um, or any other combination of operating systems. Um, that's, that's the basis of the software. I think one of the real um, important benefits with SESM is that there's native multi-streaming. And we're not kidding about native multi-streaming. That means 64 concurrent jobs per tape drive. That also means uh, unlimited jobs to disk storage. Um, using Red Hat storage, we could have um, a dozen servers, some in the data center, some in cloud, some at other remote locations, um, all writing at the same time. Generally, that unties your hands as far as the, the storage goes and makes it so you don't really have to worry about um, you know, scalability or anything like that. Um, that's the primary functionality of the software. The other things to know are that um, you know almost everything is supported as far as uh, you know different job types. Um, if we look at the some of the supported job types, you can see some of them listed here. Um, so all the all the common email systems, we do single message restore, which makes those really easy. Um, we do bare metal recovery for Red Hat and for other um, Linuxes, and also for Windows. So once you make the bare metal backup, you know that that will be restorable no matter what hardware or uh, virtual machine you're on. Um, I think that can give you a lot more confidence as far as not worrying about going and digging up the same RAID controller as your, your original machine had or anything like that. Um, all the databases are, are well supported. Um, our MySQL support also works with Maria. And so um, you know, there are no, no concerns there. Um, some of the other things, SharePoint supported, VMware, we support both interfaces. Um, for our system recovery uh, backups, we take the registry, the system restore cabinets, uh, as well as the Windows updates, so everything that Microsoft recommends. Um, and that's fully supported for all the different operating systems. It also uh, includes Active Directory uh, by default. So um, that's really the, the basis of the software, I think, under the hood. Um, you have a lot of control as a user. You have the, the GUI is a standard SQL client, so you're able to see um, everything that's going on with the GUI um, and what, what queries it's making. Also, the system logs everything that it does on the back end. So you're able to see you know, tape removed, tape added, checking the size of the Red Hat storage, anything like that. Um, and there we go. So now all of our backups is completed. Um, this is actually an interesting demo because uh, this firewall machine is actually the router uh, for this Windows machine we're backing up. So um, it was able to, you know, to do the hypervisor level snapshots, back up the whole virtual machine um, while we were actually uh, using it. So um, you know, you're able to do any of the hypervisor level backups whenever you want during daytime, during use, um, and not cause any service interruption. Um, at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. Awesome, James. That was great. Um, we do, we do we do have a couple questions in. Um, so first question, uh, do backups follow the traditional weekly full backups and daily incrementals? 
Um, and 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 that's really up to the the user, the administrator. Uh, we can definitely set everything to be backed up. Um, you know, in a typical GFS rotation, that's fine. Uh, we have you know we have hundreds, thousands of customers with with very varied needs. Uh, so you know, some folks keep one copy of their data, and as soon as they have a new backup, that gets erased, and they keep one copy, and that's it. Other people, you know, we have. 40 different copies of the same data at 40 different locations. Um, you know, some people have di full dailies for a full year. Um, so it, it really just depends on, on your needs and what, you know, SLA requirements are applicable, if any, and just kind of the way you'd like to see things structured. So as far as scheduling in our software, it's totally open, um, you know, to schedule however you know, an individual prefers. Um, we, we definitely have some recommendations of, of, you know, ways that we schedule. Like James mentioned, um, one of the things that we like to do is to set up task groups. So that way, if you add a new server, you don't have to go in and set up a new schedule for that server or figure out when it needs to get backed up. All you do is drag and drop it into that task group and it automatically sets the schedule, includes it in that backup task, and when that task starts, it just starts backing up all of those servers at the same time. So, you know, you don't have to go in and figure out how long is this database going to take to back up, what's the priority level between, you know, this and all the other ones, and what order should I put everything in, and how long are they all going to take, and what media are they going to. Um, you know, and, and especially with the Red Hat storage option, you can just select one target, and you can have all of the jobs kick off at the exact same time. So, I mean, really, it, it doesn't get a whole lot easier than that. Okay, um, other questions. Um, okay, can, uh, can SCP back up to multiple locations using Red Hat storage at the same time? And um, James, I'll, I'll turn that over to you. But but I believe, yeah, that's that's not a problem. We can have the different streams going to different locations all at the same time. Correct. Correct. And actually, Testament is a server-to-server -server architecture, which means that all of the different uh, backup jobs stream directly from the client to the target storage. Um, with Red Hat storage, that could be on the local machine or it could be remote. Um, any combination is supported, and the data does not have to go through the backup server. Uh, necessarily. So um, really, uh, it's just a direct stream from the client to the storage you choose. Okay, great. Okay, any other questions, um, either on, on SCP or on, on Red Hat Storage? All right, give you guys a second to, uh, to put in any additional questions. All right, well, it looks like we have um, Answered, answered everybody's questions. Um, so we will also um, be doing another uh, webinar, which I think Richard will give a little more information about. Um, and also, one thing that we invite you guys to do is if you do have any individual questions that are kind of based on your infrastructure or your environment, um, if you'd like to see any more um, you know, information or maybe even set up a proof of concept of your own in your own environment. Uh, that's something we, we would invite you to contact us and uh, you know we'd be happy to answer any questions or if you would like to uh, you know have things set up in your own environment then uh, you know we're more than happy to kind of help uh, get through that process uh, you know walk you through the process. Um, again it, it's a very quick process. The entire SEP program is, is 54 megabytes, so it installs in minutes. We can have it up and running in you know 20, 30 minutes with jobs configured and backup started. Um, so it's, it's not a very long or drawn out process, you know, just to throw it in a test VM and and play with it a little bit to to see how it works. So um, please uh, shoot us an email or give us a call. Um, also, please feel free to uh, reach out to John, uh, John Hoffer, with any uh, questions on Red Hat storage. And um, you know, any questions that come into us, we will also coordinate with him as well and uh, make sure that, that we get all, all the questions and, and interest answered. So uh, 
from from all of us. Thank you for joining, and I will turn it over to Richard to uh, sign us off. All right, yeah, thank you everyone for joining, and also a big thanks to John for being our Red Hat Storage guest speaker. And like when I said, we are going to be doing another Red Hat Storage themed webinar here in a couple of weeks, so be on the lookout for an invite to that. Um, again, yeah, thanks to everyone who attended, and we'll see you on the next one.